this event today. Uh, we're really happy to have you here. Uh, what we are going to show you today is first of all, the housekeeping rules, let's say. So uh, this event will be recorded. Uh, your microphones are off by default. But of course, if you want to participate, you can use the chat, uh, you can write a question, you can uh, interact with others. Uh, of course, you can use the raise hand functionality in Zoom. Uh, also, all the presentations and recording, don't worry, they will be shared afterwards on the event page. Uh, also, please remember that we are very social and we like social interaction. So you can use the Open Air Nexus hashtag. And my name is Androniki, of course. <laughs> And now, about the program, uh, we start in a few minutes with Paolo, uh, with a welcome and the presentation of the Open Air Nexus project. Uh, hope you enjoy it. And let's start. Paolo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Androniki. Let me share my screen. So thank you all. I'm Paolo Mangi. I'm the CTO of the, of the Open Air Infrastructure, and I'm coordinating uh, this project, Open Air Nexus. Uh, Open Air Nexus is one of the uh, infra EOS Go 7 uh, projects funded uh, together with others uh, to deliver services in support and, uh, of the EOSC and to contribute to the overall construction of the EOSC. As the other projects has a duration of 30 months and a budget of around 4 million. Uh, the coordinator is the Open Air Anke, it's a, a no-profit. And we have 11 partners. So many of them were already part of uh, previous adventures in, in, of open air. We've been building services and digital services for open science together for more than 10 years, while others were new to this context and uh, joined us to offer their own services uh, in a package way uh, in support of open science in general. So as you can see, the project is, uh, uh, highly tailored to virtual access and so service provision. There's not much uh, of investments into uh, uh, extra uh, functionalities or extra and extensions. Um, the only uh, portion uh, of extension and enhancement that has been supported is the one for the integration uh, to the EOSC, to the EOSC and its uh, uh, interoperability framework when this will be uh, delivered. So uh, just to give you uh, a view from the moon, a panorama uh, of uh, where we are in this uh, context, how open and Nexus and open air as a whole, in fact, in fact um, um, is linked to the overall panorama of science. So we take a look at this picture. So on the left side, you see uh, the general uh, high level modeling of a life cycle, right? So where you have experimentation, you have analysis of the results, you tend to publish them uh, when possible uh, in early stage or in later stage. The idea is that you want to share with uh, the whole public or maybe a subset of it, like a group of researchers, your lab, your organizations. But in general, you tend to share. Uh, also at earlier stage, there normally is uh, the final publishing. And then you want this, uh, these results to be uh, discovered. So that's why you're sharing. Uh, the metadata and all the possible things that enable the, the discovery. And then uh, still on the left side, when somebody will find what they need to perform science, they will need to reassemble and experiment. So in, in this case, we have um, clusters, research infrastructures, storage and computer infrastructures uh, living on the left side of the picture. And AAI, of course, embracing the whole picture. Uh, because what is really important uh, in, after publishing or in general as a consequence of publishing is also tracking usage, is also uh, uh, ensuring a quality assessment of the given results. And this is done in several ways through peer review, citations or feedback, and also monitor, uh, for example, uh, the results of this quality assessment as well as the publishing. So to keep track uh, of all the aspects um, of science. In, in, in general, or the life cycle. So the principle is that whenever I publish something, I should be able to track it, link it to the rest, and do this in a uniform manner, following standards. This is where Open Air Nexus lives uh, and stands um, and offers the services for. In, especially in this project, we focused on the aspects of publishing, uh, discovering science, and monitoring. 
uh, sites. So the project objectives are five as described in the description of activities. The first one, uh, as I mentioned before, is to support publishing services in support of the research life cycle as a whole. So the idea here is again to fill the gap uh, because publishing, of course, take place also in, within research infrastructures already in data repositories, uh, et cetera, okay? But when um, this is not possible for several reasons that uh, depend, of course, on the research infrastructures or the long tail of science, uh, we offer services for that. Zenodo is an example. But we also offer publishing uh, for other kinds of products like DNPs, data management plans, or data anonymization, again, with the intention of um, uh, compensating where uh, the gap stands or supporting when this is needed. The objective too instead is about tracking and monitoring the evolution of science. These are two key aspects which we believe are separate. On the one hand, we want to track, so keep track of everything that is an event that happens from publishing, citations, interlinking, uh, processing, usage, and uh, on the second, uh, in the second hand, instead you need to monitor, so to make uh, uh, to come up with indicators that may uh, result uh, from all these basic facts, this information that we're tracking. These two uh, activities require definitional standards, common intentions, agreements where possible, and of course, uh, uh, ability to uh, monitor, to so offer services that are able to uh, cope with large amounts of data, uh, stand with the requirements of those who need monitoring, like institutions, funders, arise, uh, etc. Objective three is uh, instead support cross-discipline discovery. So we are also aiming at providing discovery services across uh, the different di disciplines or within the, dis the different disciplines, and especially across the different kinds of research products that are today available out there. We're not talking, of course, uh, anymore about publications only, but also uh, uh, to a very large and broader spectrum of uh, products such as data, software, protocols, uh, virtual machines where this is necessary. And with the introduction of the EOS, this will include and span over services, computing, resources, et cetera. Um, the objective four and five, uh, we believe are of course uh, critical for, for the EOS and for science as a whole. So defining commons, defining best practices, common intentions and common um, uh, ideas and agreements on how we should publish in order to make science open, fair and reproducible. In some aspects, this is very specific to the disciplines. Uh, of course, reproducibility especially is a very discipline, is very discipline flavored in a way. In other cases, this is not the case. And where possible, we should uh, collaborate and here, here, Nexus offer uh, a lot to the EOSC. Uh, finally, the revenue models for open science. Open science is free at the point of usage, but of course has a cost, has a price. And so we are also uh, trying to identify the best ways for this kind of services, the cate this category, specific category of services to uh, become sustainable, to support the right and proper business models. So this is a picture uh, that represents, uh, again, from the moon, from the moon uh, what we are offering as uh, a project. We have three, say, let's say, sub-portfolios, which will uh, uh, come up into one catalog, the one we're offering with, uh, with OpenAir. Uh, on the published uh, side, we have Episciences for publishing journals, uh, overlay journals, Zenodo, which we all know about for publishing any kind of content. It's called the catch-all repository for that. Uh, Amnesia for the anonymization of sensitive data and Argos for the creation, maintenance and publishing of data management plans, which are machine actionable. Uh, for monitor, we have uh, a core service, which we call the research graph, which basically builds uh, one of the largest collection of metadata on the planet regarding uh, funders, uh, regarding projects, publications, data, software, organizations, authors, and all the possible relationships uh, around them that interconnect them. And through uh, this graph, we offer a number of monitoring services to uh, identify uh, statistics about initiatives, uh, research initiatives like research infrastructures, for example, the research impact, or the funders, so how many publications are to be have been uh, funded by a given funder or data or software, for example, and the same goes for institution. 
To build the graph, we have a number of services around, around it, which are building sub collections, which are strategic for the uh, uh, aim of monitoring. Uh, for example, Skull Explorer, which brings in uh, the largest collection of links between data and uh, articles. Open citations, uh, which brings one of the largest uh, collection of open citations between publications and publications. Open APC, uh, that uh, grows uh, a collection of uh, a database of open APC charges uh, for publications coming from the libraries, which helps us a lot in tracking how open science uh, is taking up and which are the costs behind it. And use it counts which is uh, a service that builds on standards for user statistics, which are, we are today using to uh, track the user statistics for publications, but we will extend it for data. Discover, of course, exploits the graph that I just explained to offer uh, uh, discipline specific or regional specific, because we can, uh, um, uh, let's say, drill down to the scope of the country or, or, an, or a continent. <laughs> Uh, discovery uh, functionalities. Uh, we offer these also through APIs, as you will see, which are open and usable. And uh, we uh, also offer finally, and that's part of the discover because we believe it's a key element, uh, provide. Provide is, uh, is a service that allows us basically to validate the content that we collect from uh, the data sources that are part uh, of the open air, the scholarly communication data sources from which we collect the data. We, validate uh, their metadata in terms of uh, uh, guidelines that have been defined by the community uh, to align on common standards. And this is an approach that we'd like to extend to the use case well. Uh, now, where is uh, OpenAir uh, and old OpenAir Nexus uh, placed with respect to the EOS core and how we defined it? Uh, we offer a plethora of services, as we said, some of these are uh, part of the EOS core uh, and uh, will become part of it. The open air research graph, uh, namely, is the one that will offer the EOS resource catalog and support uh, that provide, as I mentioned, will extend the sort of validation to the communities that do not offer these functionalities uh, to include uh, uh, metadata information through, through the catalog of the EOS. We'll offer the Open Science Observatory, which is a way to uh, inspect the trends of open science in terms of open, openness, fairness, publications, links uh, for the EOSC, and also open air as user statistics, which will extend to, to data repositories. The rest of the services, of course, will be part of the exchange and is already part of the exchange where they are all registered. Uh, as a whole, uh, as I mentioned before, most of the uh, project funding and budget uh, Aims at uh, is aimed at uh, operating the services, um, so virtual access and prov provision of virtual access, and part of it uh, to the integration with the EOSC. So the EOSC uh, is only partly uh, establishing rules of participation for the moment. Uh, there are strong uh, indications of what will happen, and of course we are trying to anticipate some of the choices. And we strongly believe that picking standards widely used standards is the way to go in this case. And so, for example, on the left side, we are, of course, onboarding all of our services. We are making sure they comply with the AAIs, like EduGame and so on, as offered by the US today. We are also going in the direction of accounting and monitoring by making sure that all services are bringing uh, indicators of usage um, and KPIs as defined in the description of activities, of course, but through standards, which will allow us to then centrally bring to the EOSC uh, these results um, when uh, the, the, the new uh, indications and rules will be delivered, because we believe standards are interoperable in most cases. And semantically speaking, we're trying to adapt uh, all the data models that we have to the indication of the EOSC, which we're going towards the service description templates, we're going towards the data profile templates being defined in EOSC ends, and we are building together uh, the research products uh, data models, starting from the ones of open air and converging towards new EOS and DOORS uh, data models. The same happens for user statistics and other concepts like wide and broad adoption of persistent identifiers, trying to embed fairness as a property of our uh, data sources, uh, etc. 
uh, finally, this is the last slide, which uh, brings us all here, and we also have a session dedicated to this. But we also uh, believe that uh, Nexus will be a chance to effectively bring something to the EOS by collaborating with uh, the rest of the infra, uh, infra 07 projects. This is key for us. We have a few ideas, a couple of ideas, and we'd like to propose them and see what we can do together, especially in uh, the direction of enabling seamless publishing of research outcomes. So the idea is basically to make sure that uh, scientists, while they are performing sciences in their own infrastructures, by simple actions, delegate machines uh, to publish on their behalf and to do it properly, to do it in a way that is fair, uh, driven to do in a way that is at least trackable uh, at all times. So tracking the links between the, or the, the results and in a way that would allow users uh, at the final end, at the end of the stream, not only to discover uh, these results, but also to combine them in proper ways. Where possible to be brought back to the original research infrastructures where the uh, experiments can be reproduced as a whole. We already have some experience in that and so uh, we'd like this chain that you see from the left side where research uh, infrastructures are and e-infrastructures uh, are uh, to bring uh, the users of these uh, scientific services integrated with the repositories where the objects are deposited and finally be published in the scholarly communication services, which include open air that reaches out to Scopus, uh, to ORCID, uh, to software heritage, etc. We are all integrated. So uh, I am done with my presentation. So I hope you uh, you understood uh, the flavor of what I wanted to say. You will now have a series of presentation going into the detail of the individual services that I uh, mentioned as part of the architecture. And uh, again, as Andreniki said, please uh, write questions or ask questions when you think this is the case. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, Paulo, you have a question here. Okay. Where do preprints fit? And is it open to independent preprint repositories other than Zenodo? Yes, of course. So OpenAir is uh, collecting from 14,000 data sources today. Uh, it includes not only Zenodo, it's just one of the 14,000. So it includes all possible journals out there, preprint servers, uh, data repositories, software repositories. Whenever these uh, we, uh, are, let's say, sources that we identify as trusted by users, so uh, used every day, uh, then we uh, want to include them. We want to include them, especially if they uh, rely on persistent identifiers, that helps a lot. Because whenever we bring in a data source to metadata, persistent identifiers, this data source becomes interlinked with all the rest in the graph. So the data source gains in visibility, but also in content. Uh, for example, if we have the links that are pointing to your objects, you will get all these links. And we can also return them to you. We have services that do that. We call them brokers. Uh, and we can send back all the metadata that you need. For example, the open access version of an article you have, or the links to the software or the projects of your uh, 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 publication, so data in your repository. So yes, we are very open to that. Okay, the second question is about sharing the presentations. Yes, everything will be shared. Yes. Uh, we have one more question. Uh, do you have one minute, uh, Paolo, to explain yes. also? When do you say data repositories, do you mean the ability to ingest actually? Okay. Uh, so there is a, dis a difference here. So in, in open air, uh, we are not trying to offer uh, uh, deposition facilities, okay? So we're not trying to replace what the research infrastructures are there for. We strongly believe that the thematic approach is the one to go. So if you have repositories in your community, this is where you have to deposit uh, your data, your software, your publication. These are the right places. In all those cases where these uh, repositories are not available, and this may be well the case for some uh, communities, which we know uh, already, then we offer the node. Okay. Then on top of that, we have, we are building this research graph, 
and the research graph is a way to bring the information contained into these data sources together in order uh, to build uh, the overall map of research, right? And how it evolves over time, how the objects are linked, how the uh, authors are related and so on. So these are two distinct actions. So by data repository, I mean Figshare, I mean Pangea, I mean, uh, uh, name one, PDB, ProfDB, uh, all these will be part of the graph because they must be there to be interconnected. Uh, but we are asking the researchers to go there and deposit. So we're building the bridges. Okay, thank you very much, Paolo. Uh, let's thank you please for the proceed. questions. Okay, let's uh, maybe move on to the program unless we see the question in the next three, five if, seconds. If you want to write the questions, I can reply in the chat. Okay, so we can that would be great. Yeah. Okay. okay, so let's thank continue you. now with the, thank you very much, Paolo, with the published portfolio. Uh, where you will have a, a brief presentation of the five uh, of the four uh, services, the Node Epi Sciences, Argos, and Amnesia. So, Jose or Alex, you can start. I will be here. <laughs> yes. So, just a second. So, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Ioannidis. Uh, I'm currently located at CERN in Switzerland, and I will be talking about, I will be briefly kind of like giving an overview about Zenodo, uh, what we call the catch all repository for the long tail of research. So, Zenodo is a digital multidisciplinary repository. So, we don't serve only one specific community or domain. We, we have content from uh, uh, biodiversity, from the humanities, from uh, computer science, from uh, health sciences, uh, basically subject uh, of this. And uh, Zenodo is hosted at CERN Data Center, which has a long history of uh, <coughs> uh, serving uh, some, one of, some of the biggest uh, experiments in particle physics in the past years. And uh, Zenodo is also a place for all types of research objects. So we don't only support, uh, it's talking about the uh, text, let's say, so papers and uh, preprints and things like this. We also support data sets, software, posters, presentations, anything that's part of the research process. And by default, we allow users to upload up to, up to 50 gigabytes per record. But uh, of course, users have, can have multiple records. And of course, we're also flexible when there's special use cases for uh, larger files and larger data sets are, uh, need to be shared. We try to have a, a very rich metadata schema so that you know data on itself can be described very uh, uh, thoroughly and then to be easily, let's say, shareable and searchable and trackable for other systems. And uh, we'll also try to integrate very well with, with uh, for example, the funding agencies and, uh, and grants and projects. So there's a, there is the possibility to, to, to have this holistic view of uh, uh, what the project's outputs are and uh, some of that. Zenodo, of course, is accessible via a web uh, interface, but uh, we also have REST APIs that uh, make it possible, for example, for users to set up programmatic uh, like, uh, workflows and automated workflows that, that upload or fetch or uh, uh, let's, say, let's say more complex uh, uh, use cases. And uh, to date, uh, basically what we, what we see as a service is that we have around 15 million visitors per year. Uh, to, to date, we have almost 2 million records. And, this, um, and these records amount to about half a petabyte of files stored in the CERN data center, which is just a fraction, of course, compared to the, all the rest of the data that the uh, CERN produces. So why use another? And uh, who should be using another, right? Uh, basically, another provides a reliable infrastructure for all researchers, and especially for those who don't possibly have a dedicated domain or institution or repository. So it's a way to make it easy to, to, to share uh, this data uh, when it's not, uh, let's say, when it's not straightforward where this data should go. Uh, and also the idea is that uh, it lowers the barriers to share uh, in general data or software or basically any kind of uh, research outputs. Uh, and the idea is that this by sharing on the node, this data is the, these objects are automatically compatible with the, with the fair principles, and it's also it's also an easy way. We try to make it very easy and uh, like uh, as, as hassle free as possible. And the node also exposes user statistics, so there's a way to track the impact of of what the, what the, these outputs have, and we also try to integrate citations to to, to be able to expose this 
uh, for, for researchers to be able to interpret basically what's the impact based on this. Uh, it is part of EOSC, and uh, basically the, the value it adds is that it makes the process of sharing research as easy as possible. So it, it's, it's, it's a no-brainer to, to be able to go to another one in doubt. You can always go to another and always uh, deposit your, uh, your uh, outputs there. And uh, it can be used by researchers directly. Uh, it can be used by communities of researchers for specific domains or topics or uh, well, thematic, let's say, uh, uh, cases. But uh, it's also useful for project coordinators and PIs that uh, want to organize all the outputs of a project, for example, in a specific case. To use a node, of course, I mentioned there's a web, there's a web uh, interface, and uh, we try to make it as simple as possible and uh, understandable to everyone. Uh, of course, there's also REST API for the, these advanced use cases I mentioned. And also, we try to integrate with other platforms uh, to make, for example, the, the process of uh, like researchers that develop uh, the research software on, on GitHub, for example, they can easily uh, archive it in Zenodo and get the UI. And, all this process for them to be kind of like easy and uh, and, uh, and uh, not something that they have to consciously think about and uh, track. And now to kind of like give you a picture of what exactly is the position of the node in this bigger ecosystem of, of open air and, and uh, EOSC. Basically, as I mentioned, researchers can directly deposit things on the node, uh, but also there's many cases where they come through other services. So for example, they use GitHub or they use, for example, Amnesia or Argos, which are services you will hear about later. And uh, the, the, the activity they do in these uh, services ends up in Zenodo. And then we have also automated uh, our platforms that uh, have, uh, like in the biodiversity community, we have a very complex, uh, we have a use case where uh, basically there's uh, uh, an automated pipeline where the <coughs> figures and uh, other type of information and metadata is extracted automatically from papers and put on the node. Uh, and of course, everything that uh, gets uh, ends up in Zenodo also ends up in Open Air Explorer. And of course, uh, the user statistics are also sent to, uh, the, um, to the Open Air Usage Caps uh, service. So the key takeaway I would say is that uh, Zenodo is a, it's a place where for where it's, it's place free for everyone, but uh, for sharing the data, it's uh, it's made. We try to make it very easy for you to, to, to do that, and uh, we also try to follow the best practices in uh, in doing that, so that researchers automatically are compatible with this, and we don't have to think too much about uh, uh, what they should be, uh, what what these best what these best practices are. And of course, it's also more about just papers, uh, trying to make it a place where every part of the research pipeline, every, every, part the, every part of the research workflow is something that is archivable and something that can be put, uh, can be tracked and, and, uh, and, uh, and shared basically uh, in the open. And uh, this is also part of our mission to, to, to promote reproducibility of these results. Uh, and that's all for the moment. Thank you very much, Alex. And now we can move on with episode. Alex, you have two couple of questions. So if you we, maybe you can, can respond one live and okay, because we have a 10 minutes uh, session for QA okay, okay. later. Okay. That's why okay. we'll, let's collect all your, the questions. Yeah. yeah, so type in your answers. I will well. type in the yeah, okay. thank you. Yeah. Okay. So Rafael, please start. Can you hear me? Yes, clear. Yes, okay. So good morning, I'm Raphael Thomas. I will try to share my screen. Uh, okay, so I'm Raphael Tournois. I work for the Peace Sciences uh, platform. It's a Novelet journal platform. And um, what is a Novelet journal? It's a journal whose content is hosted on uh, open archives. So for the Peace Sciences uh, platform, we operate on top of open access repositories such as HAL, Archive, CWR, and very soon Zenodo. The Peace Sciences platform enables the management of the entire scientific publication cycle. So it means uh, submission, certification, copy editing, dissemination, and preservation. The platform is a layer of services for the scientific communities and enables them to um, operate high quality open access journals 
with content hosted hosted on the open access repository of a choice. By design, it is uh, both gold open access because journal content is available in open access, of course, and green open access because content is already self-archived self in an open repository. We can also call it diamond open access because there is no reader fees, no paywall. There is also no author fees, no IPCs, and even no fees for journals to use the platform. So why to use EpiSciences? Uh, EpiSciences is designed for the scientific communities. It is designed to save time for the readers because preprints are already available and all of the sub subsequent versions are already accessible during the peer review, peer review process. It saves time also for the researchers because documents are submitted once and are available in open access at the same time on the repository and on the journal website. Also, it saves time for editorial teams because we provide an all-in-one submission management and publishing system. By design, it complies with FAIR principles with both, both for the repository aspects and the journal aspects. The scientific communities can control the entire publication process. So it means the submission of articles, management of peer review, follow-up of reviewers, automatic renewenders, for instance, for instance, also, and copy editing, and finally publication. We provide the tools and we organize the content at the peer review, peer review as they wish. Long-term access to the articles is guaranteed by the submission in an open archive. Uh, so whatever the evolution of the journal, if a journal were to disappear, for instance, the content will remain online thanks to repositories that was the content. The operating cost uh, is reduced because we share an IT infrastructure with other public services, such as the R repository, for instance, and the hosting cost of preprints and articles are in fact spread over all the different open access repositories. The platform itself is hosted in Europe. Uh, so how to use EpiSciences? In fact, each journal has its own domain name, so you have to select the journal on which one you want to publish. For instance, let's try with uh, LMCS, Logical Methods in Computing Sciences, it's all still on EpiSciences. This is the, the home page on the right. So the first step is to submit your preprint on the repository, say for instance, we will try with archive for this uh, article. You see on the right, the article, this is the first version submitted on archive. It has received an archive ID. So the next step is to copy and paste the archive ID on the submission page of the journal. You just have to paste the archive ID and the version number. So here, the example is to submit the version one. The next step, is to is the job of the journal, in fact, because there will be multiple rounds of uh, peer review and uh, multiple versions may be submitted online and on archive and also in the journal. If you look carefully on the right, uh, you will see the submission history of this uh, paper. And there is, in fact, 10 versions that have been submitted on archive. It means that could be also 10 versions submitted on the journal and reviewed. Um, the final step is uh, when the paper is ready to be published by the journal, once it has been accepted and reviewed by peer reviewers and the copy editing is done, uh, it is published by the journal. And you see on the right, you have the paper that is published on the, on the LMCS journal page. It has received a DOI, it is in volume 16, for instance, issue two. And these information are also automatically put in archive. So you see on the left, in the green box, you have the journal name, the reference, and the GOI. All these things are automatically added to, to archive by the platform. <clears throat> so what are the key points here? Um, the key point is that EpiSciences is an easy and cost-efficient way to operate high-quality open access journals. It is designed for the scientific communities to operate uh, journals free to read, free to submit, and uh, free to publish uh, from the point of view of the journal. We open to new journals or already existing journals. Please submit uh, new journals or submit to our, exi our existing journals. And we are, of course, open to every scientific field. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rafael. Thank you. There are some questions already. We will collect them all uh, also in the chat. So we have a specific session. Uh, let's move on to Argos. 
Yeah, All right. Hi, everyone. Hi, good morning. Let me, good morning, everyone. Let me share my screen and make view. All right, perfect. So, good morning, everyone. I am El Papadopoulou. I work for the Research Innovation Center in Greece. And today I'll give you a brief overview of Argos, which to give a brief overview of Argos is really hard for me. So, uh, be, be, bear with me, please. Uh, first of all, what is Argos uh, all about? Uh, Argos is a tool for planning uh, your research data management activities according to policies set uh, by funders, by institutions around open access and fair data. So essentially, it's uh, a tool that helps create, that helps researchers uh, create their data management plans, in short, DMPs, I will call them from now on. It's open source. Uh, it can be configured to different, uh, the, to different uh, domains and uh, and needs, and it can be also extended um, through uh, the, the software, the open source uh, software uh, repository. It's online, you can use it online uh, by going to the website argos.openyourdata.eu or, uh, or deploy it at own institutions, own instances. Um, it's available uh, also in EOSC uh, and you can uh, freely use it uh, for uh, research purposes. Uh, as a, in your projects. Uh, our user database is currently around 1,000 user, 1, users, but it's growing. It's a, a, a fairly a new service of openers. So uh, this, this is growing um, every day that we, that we speak. Um, let me see, all right. So uh, you might be thinking that this is yet another DMP tool, but uh, I would uh, urge you to think otherwise. And this is uh, th these are my arguments for doing that. So here uh, I've uh, I've selected a few key points that show the value added of Argos uh, and uh, some extra functionalities that it provides to the open science community. So first of all, uh, why to use Argos is because it not only helps create uh, data management plans, but also uh, extends uh, and supports a full DMP uh, publication lifecycle because it integrates with Zenodo and it supports the publication process that is needed to uh, then uh, expose those DMPs once they are generated from Argos to expose them in the repositories uh, in appropriate uh, ways. Uh, according to, of course, open and fair principles and practices that are tied to, to, this, uh, to this process. Second of all, uh, the outputs of Argos are machine actionable, meaning that they can be, that they, they are not just uh, plain text, they, they, have, uh, they are more rich and they can be exchanged to, uh, between different um, compliant, machine actionable compliant, let's say, tools. And one of the things that we are doing in Argos is we try to, th through, through this platform, through this tool, we try to normalize the descriptions of data. Uh, so Argos pushes actually towards that, uh, not only, this means that it would not only support domain protocols and standards to be configured in the templates, but also we uh, allow multiple data sets to be described in single DMPs. And this is important because um, the approach that we follow is data centric. So different types of described data sets are handled appropriately uh, within Argos because we see that there are different criteria that have to be met and uh, not only by researchers, but also by funders. Uh, when we talk about produced data, different criteria when we talk about reused data, sensitive data and so on. And this is very important because it, we, we try to give control over the individual data set rather than having uh, all data sets uh, mixed in a single DMP record. Uh, also, Argus in, in, is interlinked and connected with reference services and data sources. We'll see in a minute how um, it, it's, uh, how, how it is, how, where it stands in the open air ecosystem and EOSC. And we also try to, we actually, uh, love collaborating with others. We thrive by uh, in collaborating with others and in communicating and exchanging uh, ideas and knowledge with the open science community. So we try to get involved um, in this evolving, uh, let's say, uh, uh, environment of uh, machine actionability uh, in DMPs. Um, and one of the things that we are doing, for example, uh, we collaborate with Provide. Uh, the other service for uh, from Opener to try and um, influence uh, repositories to 
uh, apply the correct resource type in the metadata for DMPs to be properly exposed. Um, our main users are researchers, uh, research projects, funders, research communities and institutions. And here you see how uh, our um, machine action of the DMP output looks like. Uh, briefly, uh, what you can do as an end user in Argos, here you see the DMP, a DMP record. You see the basic the data, the, the basic, uh, here's the title of the DMP, here is the version of the DMP, we support versioning. Uh, the last time that it was edited, what is the status of this DMP? It could be draft, here it's finalized. You can clone the DMP, you can delete it. Uh, you can see what uh, the grant is, it is, um, associated with uh, the researchers that have worked uh, in this uh, in the data management activities, what is the description of a DMP and how many data sets are described in this particular DMP. Um, you can deposit it immediately by, by clicking this button. Uh, you create a record in Zenodo. You can undo the finalization and work on uh, uh, finished work before uh, finalizing it and deposit it. You can export in PDF, text, and uh, XML and JSON. You can start new version, make public, so revert the, the private uh, settings um, and make it public in the Argos um, uh, environment for everyone to see. And you can also share it with uh, colleagues so that you manage workload uh, amongst uh, the in in the this process of the DMP writing. Once you click the node, uh, once you click deposit, sorry, uh, you will immediately get. Uh, the reference, uh, the DOI here, and you can always view it uh, if you go to your DMP record in Argos and click and get redirected to the Zenodo record. Here is the same screen, but for data sets. So this is a data set record and you can um, see the difference uh, because we are using different color schemes to, to note that this is data sets. Data sets are in yellow and the uh, DMPs are in uh, green. Again, you can finalize it, export it, all the same functionality supply. Uh, and what you see if you are uh, working on the data set level is uh, the template that, uh, is, um, that is provided by funders or institutions. And you uh, see on, on here, on the, on the left-hand side, you can see the different steps, the different sections included in this template uh, to that you can view the screen where you have all the information uh, um, uh, on your on how uh, to to properly let's say uh, complete uh, and answer your questions um, and provide your input in in the fields. Uh, Argos uh, is not only uh, provided in English, but we have, uh, th thanks to our NOADS, the National Open Access Desk in OpenAir, we have different localizations. You can see some of them here, so it, we make it easier for native uh, researchers to, uh, to use it. Uh, and we're very excited about this. Uh, it, it's coming in March this, this month. Um, the administrator's interface, uh, we have tried to simplify how uh, users how admin users uh, can create their DMPs uh, template, the DMP templates in Argos, um, how they can configure uh, their APIs and to control uh, the RDA compliance. But for the latter, we have to, uh, this is done in consultation with us, uh, with the Argos team, because we have to test that uh, it, it actually works. Um, very quickly, how uh, these are all linked together, uh, how, how the different services of the open air ecosystem are linked together. Uh, you see uh, from Argos, you, we have integrated Zenodo, so you, we publish uh, DMPs as machine actionable DMPs in Zenodo. Uh, and sorry, I have also these screens. And you can see that uh, before being published, we integrate we have configured some opener and, and the EOSC API uh, so that we make it easier for uh, researchers to complete their DMPs by pre-selected uh, lists and then make links with the research graph at a later stage. But once the machine action DMP is there, we can then, uh, and this is, uh, this, this is uh, prog progress, this is work in progress, we are working with provide so that once a DMP uh, mentions uh, a data set is going to be deposited in, in the X repository, uh, provide will send 
a notification to the uh, repository manager so that they organize themselves and prepare for this data set to be deposited uh, in, the, in the repository. Then uh, we also send notifications. Uh, we work with the monitor to, to create indicators, basic indicators for um, understanding how uh, DMPs, uh, different statistics, get different statistics for, for DMPs. Uh, and we work with funders also to, to uh, get tailored, uh, like to, to understand their needs about this. Uh, and once Argos is published, it's, uh, it, it enters the research graph, it creates a new entity in the research graph, properly described, and, uh, and creates uh, also links with different outputs. Here we create links with data sets and also with projects that are associated with, uh, with the DMP. Uh, and all that are uh, searchable in, in Explore. Plus, we are working with Explore to create uh, to to create a tab dedicated for DMPs. Will uh, the project uh, the coordinators will view all the different versions of DMPs in one tab and can report back uh, to to the EC. The takeaway is that uh, that I want you to to remember is that Argos prepares all stakeholders for the next Horizon Europe DMPs requirements and for the Cister uh, new call requirements. Cister is also another funder that we are working on, funders consortium. Uh, Argos simplifies administrative processes and connects with university institutional workflows. So if you uh, if you have own instances, you can create your own uh, let's say links with uh, the local uh, ecosystems. And Argos also uh, implements, uh, enables the implementation of the data domain protocols so that research communities create templates tailored to domain standards and practices. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, get more, uh, get and answer your questions. Thank you very much for now. Thank you, Ellie. Thank you. Uh, we need to move in to move into the next one. Amnesia, so I know this. Okay. I'm Manuel Theovitis, and I'm going to give you a brief presentation of uh, the Amnesia tool, uh, which is uh, a data anonymization tool. Uh, it's been developed in Athena Research Center, where I work. Uh, okay, uh, as the previous presenters, I also have this problem of presenting uh, all this in a very uh, concise and uh, short uh, presentation. Uh, so basically what an anonymization does is data anonymization. Now, uh, anonymization is a word uh, that uh, we have been using forever uh, in uh, everyday life and even in science, uh, meaning several different things. Uh, what I mean uh, here is a bit more specific is anonymization as defined in the GDPR and as uh, uh, technically uh, approached in several research papers, which is uh, an irreversible transformation of the data where the guarantees that the anonymized data cannot reveal properties of the original personal data. And this is uh, a distinction from what GDPR calls pseudo-anonymization, which is uh, uh, what we uh, very commonly uh, mean as anonymization, which is just the removal of direct identifiers, but without uh, any type of uh, guarantee that we cannot return to the original data via uh, linking to uh, a third database, which can provide us the links. Um, this can be done explicitly, but this also happens when the secondary identifiers like the date of birth or the zip code of where a person lives that can be used to re-identify the data. So uh, the data anonymization performed by Amnesia is a transformation that makes, uh, that transforms personal data to statistical data. And I will also argue later, this is a very important distinction because uh, statistical data are no longer restricted by GDPR. Now, Amnesia uh, is available. Uh, the best way to use it is a standalone uh, application. Uh, it is uh, uh, made in a modular way. There's a very clear distinction of the back end, uh, the anonymization engine that uh, uh, works with the front end through a REST API 
uh, the back end is made in Java, the front end is in JavaScript. So we have uh, deployed it and it is available as online in the site, but this is mostly for training and, and demo purposes. Uh, the, the idea behind this is uh, that usually uh, both technical and legal restriction do not allow you to take the personal data out of your own premises. So you have to bring Amnesia to your premises and not the data to Amnesia uh, servers. Um, okay, except this little type about year 2020, uh, we really had uh, 34K unique visitors in Amnesia site in uh, 2020. I uh, hope we we'll have a lot more in 2020. Uh, and uh, there's a bit less than 5,000 uh, uh, users of uh, the online service. I guess people that's people training, uh, that's people uh, using it in demos. Um, so uh, wh why should one use Amnesia? As I said before, the, by transforming personal data to statistical data, uh, the data are no longer restricted by the GDPR. By GDPR. So basically can be shared uh, uh, an institution that uh, produces data, can give it to its partners at the, un at the university, uh, can give the anonymized data to its partners at the university, and they can do research on them. So uh, anyone who has data and wants to give them to uh, partners or to a greater or smaller audience uh, will be interested to use Amnesia. Uh, so it does uh, uh, irreversible, irreversible transformation uh, the data and the basic idea, uh, the key technical challenge is how to remove all identifying information but preserve all the useful information for, uh, uh, for research. And the, there are many solutions to this, different trade-offs, and in the technical level, this is where research and technical challenges arise. Uh, it's a value-added services for EUSC. We expect that uh, data owners, data curators, and researchers uh, will uh, use it and benefit for it. Uh, researchers are also, of course, it can be the same person or entities acting uh, in these roles at the same time. Uh, but uh, the basic uh, idea dream of uh, uh, anonymizing the data is that instead of having a limited quantity of uh, uh, personal data that can be shared only un under uh, NDAs and uh, uh, strict rules, we can have uh, a very big, uh, a very big uh, ecosystem of anonymized data where they can be shared freely. Uh, this data might be of reduced uh, accuracy because of the anonymization, but they will make up for it by, but uh, we will make up for it for instance by having large quantities and the ability to do, uh, to do results, build models on, let's say, millions of. Uh, uh, data records instead of a few hundreds of thousands. Um, this is a, a very novel tool. There are no established commercial uh, solutions. Um, there are a few, uh, I think, uh, academic tools that do anonymization. Of course, Amnesia has uh, unique future, uh, features. Uh, uh, it is uh, unique in the approach of some things. So it is one of the, the very few solutions. Uh, in this area, and uh, mostly it, it is to be used by the data curator who wants to share their data. Um, I think I told you a bit uh, of uh, how Amnesia is made. You can find it uh, in amnesia.openair.eu. Uh, this is uh, the online version. Uh, we do have limitations there due to limited resources. Uh, anonymization, it's a bit like data mining, it's an exp expensive procedure. Uh, you can use the standalone version through the graphical interface. You can incorporate it to uh, information systems just using the backend engine through a REST API, or you can even use it in, through our command line interface. Um, 
Okay, just a few screenshots to get an idea. Uh, the first thing you do in Amnesia is you upload a data set. There is a wizard uh, to parse this data and make Amnesia understand what the data is. It's a bit similar to uh, the import wizard of Excel for uh, text uh, files. So people using uh, these kind of tools will be familiar. Uh, so the, the steps is that uh, we put the data, uh, we put the data, uh, we create, uh, okay, I have it here. We create a generalization hierarchy. This means the rules by which uh, um, that Amnesia will use to abstract the data to remove any kind of identifying combinations uh, of uh, data attributes. And uh, finally, depending on the algorithms, uh, Amnesia will provide a whole lattice of different solution where the user can choose uh, different ways to anonymize the data, where different trade-offs between data accuracy and privacy will be given and basically different, uh, different areas of uh, the data will be preserved, right? For example, uh, uh, depending on the research, you might be more interested on uh, the area where a person lives or, the, uh, or their age, and you can decide which one of the two you will preserve in a better way. So the positioning of uh, Amnesia uh, in, uh, in the open air ecosystem uh, is, uh, I, I think it's a bit clear, it's next to the data source. Uh, basically, uh, the data owner or curator anonymizes the data before uh, making them fair, before offering them uh, to the community. Uh, the idea is that the data owner has personal data that cannot be shared, so it anonymizes the data with amnesia and gets statistical uh, data, which the anonymized data, and then they can be inserted in the uh, EOSQ uh, ecosystem. Uh, so we expect that this happens, uh, for example, before uploading them to Zenodo. Right, Amnesia actually has uh, inherent uh, support for Zenodo, so you can anonymize the data on your premises uh, and then directly upload them through Amnesia to Zenodo. So take away, Amnesia does data anonymization, which is a different thing than pseudo anonymization. The resulting anonymous data of Amnesia are no longer personal data. They are not restricted by the GDPR. Uh, Amnesia as it is now, it is a free tool. Uh, you can download it and use it on your own premises. And it is one of the very few solutions that do data anonymization. There are several uh, solutions in commercial tools that help obscuring some properties of the data, doing masking, doing hashing of some uh, field, but none of them uh, does data anonymization in the sense that GDPR defines it. So I guess that is uh, all. Thank you very much. Uh, I see the chat flashing, so I understand there will be questions, but I think yes, uh, Andrew Neki will organize them. Yes, right. Manol, it's, uh, most of the questions are being answered. So just have a look and pay attention to the chat because if there's any question, you can answer directly. Most of the speakers have already answered, so we're, it's quite active. <laughs> okay, thank okay. you. I'm, I'm stop sharing. And... Yes, and now okay. we move on to the uh, Q&A. As I already said, uh, most of the questions are being already answered. So um, we're going to, to record all uh, the chat. So in, in case you, you have not seen all the questions because we are uh, running a little bit late. Um, but now I, I, I need you uh, to go to Menti. We have some questions for you. Um, but in case you have some questions to raise to one of the speakers uh, in the reactions button, uh, you can raise your hand or open your mic. So feel free. 
Yeah, please let's let's see what you answer also in Menti because it will be really nice for us to understand what are your interests, what is uh, that you like, what is something that which service you would prefer to use, and to understand more about you, your profile, and you know preferences, and to see that you really did understand what we dis described uh, here in, in the, with the four services. I see moving. Oh, Zenodo is a winner, I see here. Yes, I've already put the code for the ones who haven't seen them. Go to menti.com and then use the code, go to the chat. Um, there's a question for Manolis. Uh, I don't know if you want to, to answer directly or open the mic, Manolis. I will open the mic. Yes, uh, so the question. It's not just for quantitative data, it is also for qualitative data. Uh, for qualitative data, uh, the difficulty is that someone must uh, usually create the, the generalization rules, these rules for abstracting the data uh, by hand, or uh, in the case where, like the example I presented, where I see the codes where which is a predefined ontology for medical diagnosis, they can be uh, used, uh, they can be taken from some online source. So uh, this, uh, uh, so, so, so this is a, a, a more difficult challenge for qualitative data, but Amnesia does both. And uh, we do have documentation online and we're adding all, uh, new material all the time about how to use uh, the Amnesia tool. Uh, there are a few webinars that are also online and we plan to add some uh, more videos with uh, tutorials. So as we see, uh, Zenodo is the most um, known <laughs> service here. No, it's it's going to be one of our goals maybe. We can repeat these questions at the end, close in the middle of the project also in another event and see how many you, they will use also the rest of the services. So can we move to the... Yes, yes, yes please. So how to so globally access the value or the interests of these services? Let's see how the reactions. I've already um, retype again the, the access of for Menti and the code that you have here on the top of the slide also. Again, it would be nice to have more than 30 answers to have a good <laughs> view. Here, you're, you're oh, 21, let's see. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the racing of the services. Zenodo is also the most, uh, let's say, general purpose services among the four, right? Yes. Uh, it's usually by all researchers in terms of functionalities, while uh, the other three uh, are kind of uh, scoping down to specific categories of uh, researchers or officers, or so that's more reasonable. Yes, and, and Argos and Amnesia are more recent, yes. Well, it's not just the, yeah. the, the, the timing, because these are functionalities that are useful and known, but uh, if you take 10 researchers, how many of them need to uh, anonymize their data? Maybe half to one, right? Not one. Okay. And it's yes. the same for Argos. How many need to manage a data management plan? Well, they all need, but typically it's one that does it out of uh, a research group, right? And it's the same thing for uh, the sciences. Managing a journal is not an easy thing and requires experience, skills, and time, right? So again, uh, these are uh, key services for those who need them. But if you ask to a pool, this is the right percentage, I think. <clears throat> I'm actually surprised that some of them are so high. We can move to yes, the other. I think it's the last one. So we have one more question for you. In which way these services are useful in your daily activities? your daily activity, so something that makes your life easier. So what you do, your work, saves time, effort, money, resources, very important. Just try to think like you have one of these services and what will be really nice for you? 
Finding interesting publications. Okay. Free and professional grade tools I can rely on. Say produce data and services for the nodal and amnesia. And don't they end up in jail with amnesia eh? because you know if, if you use other people's data, you have a problem. Sharing project outputs all in one place for the nodal communities. Supporting compliance with European Commission requirements. The nodal repository for <coughs> the results we share. I at one point of user science should be free, sorry, free. Yeah, open, free, open access with the proper licenses. Can you go, scroll down? Yes. So not done with community. I see many people say about the nodal community functionalities. So this is very important. This is a good uh, feedback for the nodal also. Yes, uh, I think it's a key functionality and today is not re reaching its full potential it will be because I know that Zenodo is working on an evolution of the concept of community. Uh, so Alex, if you want to say more. Yes, exactly. So currently we have com communities act a bit more as collections, let's say, so they're not very, it's not a, uh, a very collaborative, let's say, uh, feature. But we're going in this direction where, for example, there's uh, the different roles in communities. There's many members. They can curate things. They can they can uh, there can be a discussion basically happening on the on the metadata and uh, and what kind of records are going. So uh, it's, it's also a big part of having quality metadata is to have curators that know how to uh, how to describe the objects very well. So. This is kind of the direction we're going now, and uh, yeah, towards the end of this year or the beginning of the next year, we will we will start seeing some of these uh, features. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I also see about amnesia. It is yes, Manoli has another two more questions for amnesia, uh, but I don't know if we want him to answer publicly or just in the chat because we are running a little bit late. Yes. Yeah, so we're um, moving yes. on. Another he important can answer aspect. In two minutes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I just want to mention one thing. Another important aspect of Zenodo, of uh, which many of you may not be aware of, is that it offers deposition facilities as well as search facilities, also via APIs. So you can integrate your services to Zenodo. So if you have a thematic service that produces a data set, you may easily extend your service to publish these data sets in Zenodo via uh, APIs. And this is what many uh, scientific services are starting to do out there. Uh, they publish their software, their software releases, they publish the results of an experiment, they publish their research objects as a whole uh, within Zenodo to get a GUI. And this is done transparently uh, from the user point of view. So we're open to discuss this further if you need it. 